Welcome to ARE Live. I'm uh, Mark Tier, the founder of Black Spectacles. And today I'm with Mike Newman, who's going to talk about our construction documents and services mock exam. Um, this is one of those tricky exams because uh, many of you guys um, probably think you already know the ins and outs of putting together drawing sets. Um, but this exam's other focus, which is contracts, uh, in many cases, these the questions that they ask about contracts are sort of word problems, and it's kind of tough to understand what they're really asking you. So we're going to run through some examples that will help you dissect the questions so you really know what they're asking uh, tonight. So but before we get started, um, if you'd like to attend our next ARE live broadcast, where we will discuss the site planning and design exam, you can visit blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. And during the broadcast, uh, just like tonight, you'll have a chance to ask questions to the group uh, and get feedback from Mike. Uh, now, if you don't know Mike, he's an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's also the founder of Shed Studio, and he's an instructor for Black Spectacles online AIA ARE prep curriculum. If you haven't already checked out our AIA ARE prep curriculum, head over to blackspectacles.com, where you can watch any of the free tutorials from the courses. Um, and today we have a couple of special things. So we have a, um, a special Black Spectacles promo code to share at the end, um, and then also we'll choose someone uh, from all the folks who submitted their answers to our mock exam. Um, and whoever the winner is will receive a free one month ARE plus software Black Spectacles membership. And uh, we'll also be tracking all of your answers and whoever gets all of the answers right from today's mock exam will get a free Black Spectacles t-shirt. Uh, so stay tuned for that as well. But first, let's hand it over to Mike. All right. All right. Thanks, Mark. Um, so as Mark was just saying, uh, the construction documents and services uh, exam focuses on sort of a whole lot of different issues, but the two big parts of the issues are putting together construction document sets, so the drawing sets and the uh, specification books, the project manuals, and also the contracts. Those are the two big things, the kind of sets and the contracts. And then there's lots of other uh, potential discussions as well. Um, and as we just started to allude to, as Mark was just saying, one of the things, you know, you know most of the time on the exams, uh, you know, if you're talking about, say, structures or, or systems or something, typically the question is fairly straightforward. You're going to get a question on, you know, whatever the topic is, and it's going to be, it's going to essentially ask you, do you know what the answer to this is? When it comes to the contracts, there'll be a few questions like that, but there'll also be a bunch of questions that are sort of more obliquely written. And you have to kind of read through the scenario that they give in order to understand what they're really actually asking. And so as we go along, uh, the questions that we have tonight are, are relatively straightforward, but as we go along, what we're going to do is we'll talk about kind of what each of the uh, questions is, is sort of really getting at and maybe a little bit about why that would be the case, but also kind of just uh, uh, kind of thinking about how you just kind of dissect those, the, both the questions and the answers uh, as we go along. So hopefully that'll make sense as we, uh, as we move forward. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's check it out. Let's start with the first one. Hang on a second here. There we go. Okay. So our first question, uh, this is a, a fairly simple question, um, but actually is uh, sometimes a little surprising to folks uh, and really comes down to kind of the way that you start to really imagine how to present information, complicated information to a lot of different people. Uh, so our question is, which is the correct order for a typical construction drawing set? And then we have a, uh, four different uh, orders of drawings uh, that would be in the drawing set. Uh, a, architecture, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, structural, civil. B, architecture, civil, structural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing. C, civil, architecture, structure, plumbing, mechanical, electric. Uh, and then D, the order changes by occupancy type. So the first thing to say is uh, D is not the answer. The order does not change by occupancy type. There could be reasons why you would do a different order than the standard. 
Um, and that could be all kinds of different reasons. Uh, it could be because of occupancy, but it's more likely that it would be because of uh, the specifics of the situation where it's just a very uh, tightly held contract. Maybe you're only doing a design set, not a full set, something like that. So there's lots of reasons why, uh, why the order might change, but in terms of the way the question is written, a typical construction drawing set, so that's one of the first things to notice is words like typical. When you see a word like that, that's something that is telling it's different from uh, always, or it's different from uh, you know, uh, um, you know, words like never or always, or uh, you know, this is this is how it will always move forward. This is saying what is the standard, and so you should be thinking about it not from a how can I answer this in a way that's that's going to show that I'm really smart. You should be thinking about this from the standpoint of what is it actually asking me? And what it's actually asking me is how does the standard thing happen most of the time? Most of us uh, would probably assume, just if you hadn't spent any time thinking about it, that we would start with the architectures, so either A or B. In fact, the actual answer is C. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, there's sort of a kind of peculiar order to these these things, and that peculiar order is that most of the of the big sets of information, architecture, structure, then all the plumbing and mechanical and electrical, uh, that sort of uh, is sort of this set thing. But before you get to those drawings, you actually start with the civil drawings, sometimes the landscape drawings, sometimes even demo drawings. And then you get into architecture, structure, plumbing, mechanical, and electric. One of the things that always throws me off on this is for years and years and years, I've always been talking about things as uh, the architecture and then the MEP, the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. And people generally will talk about it as MEP, but that's not the appropriate uh, uh, actual order. The appropriate actual order would be PME. Uh, some places will do mechanical first and then plumbing. It's kind of an interesting conversation because always the question is who goes first in terms of the uh, construction schedule. Um, but the way that most of the guidebooks will tell you, the way that sort of general preponderance of these, these things is that it'll be plumbing, mechanical, and electric, starting with civil, then architecture, and structure always comes right after the architecture. Once you get past electric, then all the other consultants, so you might have kitchen consultants, vertical transportation consultants, uh, you know, any number of other possibilities. Uh, any of those folks would happen, uh, you know, uh, fire protection, for example. All of those things would come after that first set uh, of um, uh, different uh, topics, different uh, disciplines. Um, the one sort of caveat to all of this is that the actual first sheet is usually considered an architecture sheet. Uh, so the cover sheet to the whole thing is an architecture sheet, but then it would move into civil and landscape and all of those before it gets to the typical architecture. Okay, um, it actually looks like, uh, let's see here, it looks like almost everybody got this right. Um, uh, it, actually, I would say about 90 per, 90 percent of the folks got it right. Um, Jamie has a, a, a comment here. He's saying that um, a, another resource is showing that it's it's just MEP, that that's the right answer to this one. What are your thoughts on that? That, that MEP is correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I say, I, I went through school talking about it as MEP. My office always talked about it as MEP. Uh, and then as I've started looking through the all the documentation, pretty much everybody talks about it as PME. Um, You'll see differences in different parts of the country, uh, some you know some local variation, uh, but really nobody does it as MEP generally if they're uh, uh, if they're following the sort of uh, kind of AIA guidelines. Um, so if you look at the professional handbook, uh, the Architects uh, Handbook for, for prof Professional Practice that the AIA puts out, it'll put it as PME. And if you look in Ballast and all of those kinds of places, it'll talk about it as PME. So like I say, it's always been conf confusing for me because I went through school talking about it as MEP, uh, and I still talk about it as MEP, but in fact, that's not, uh, that's not the sort of appropriate way of doing it. 
Okay, very good. Um, let's let's uh, go on to the next one then. And, and before we go on, let me just say real quick, one of the reasons for that is that you essentially put the E at the end there because the E is the one, the electric is the one that is the least in the way of everybody else. Uh, so if you're trying to sort of figure this stuff out as kind of a construction sequence, now, it, you know, a set of drawings is not the same thing as a construction sequence, but the idea is that it's sort of in line with that. And, you know, the electrical is the easy one to kind of fit around everything else. The plumbing, which has to go by gravity, at least the waste lines do, and the mechanical, which has great big duct, duct work and all of that, those things have to go first, and then the electrical can kind of fit around them. So that's why the electrical is going to the end. I mean, it's, it's not just a random thing. It's actually thinking about kind of construction sequencing and how that moves through. Uh, once you get into some of the other topics, uh, like uh, elevators and vertical transportation and things, it's kind of out of the realm of construction sequencing, because obviously that would happen pretty early in that in the construction sequencing. But it's just that it doesn't happen every time, and so that goes to the towards the end of, of the set. Okay. All right. Let's move on to number two. Number two is a little interesting one. Um, all right. Where would I find information on the number of screws that are required for securing light gauge steel studs for a partition wall? So we have two different types of answers. We have uh, A and C are floor plans and building sections, so that's talking about the drawing set. And then B and D are Division 9 and Division 5, which is talking about the CSI divisions, uh, which is presumably in this, uh, this scenario talking about the uh, specification book, the um, project manual. Uh, so let's first talk about the floor plans and the building sections. Uh, if we were talking about something as detailed as the number of screws required for securing light gauge steel studs in a uh, partition wall, that's a very particular, very detailed piece of information, but it's also a very detailed piece of information that's not a custom detail. It's not a specific detail. It's a sort of generalized detail for all of the partition walls that you would be putting in. So if you start thinking about that for a second, like well, where would you put that note on a floor plan? It just it doesn't fit to a floor plan scenario. It doesn't it doesn't it's not logical. All the partitions would have to be called out in some way. Uh, so it's clearly not the floor plans. Um, and if you imagine the floor plans being filled with that kind of information, the floor plans would become essentially unreadable. They would be you know, almost impossible to understand what the heck was going on because they'd be filled with, you know, if the partition screws are in there, then so is everything else, right? So uh, the floor plans would just be kind of uh, completely unreadable. So then what about the building sections? So let's think about a building section for a second. If you imagine a building section and, uh, well, it's going to be a terrible building section, but we'll give it a shot here. Uh, so here we have our building. Uh, kind of what's the point of a building section? <laughs> Let's hope your drawings are better than my drawings. Uh, if you look at a building section, kind of what's the point of that, of that drawing? The building sections have a couple of uh, very specific things that they're trying to get across. One is obviously a kind of uh, sense of the sort of verticality of the, of the structure, kind of how things are sort of functioning spatially. You can't really see that in a plan. You can only really see that when you combine a plan with a section. So kind of understanding that, that's an important aspect of a building section. The other thing that a building section is doing is it's giving you an opportunity uh, to put uh, vertical dimensional information. Uh, so I can start having, uh, uh, you know, heights uh, listed on this. Sometimes people will put that information also on plans, but you really shouldn't. You should really only have the vertical information, the vertical dimensioning on the building sections, sometimes also on elevations, but it should really only show up on uh, the uh, uh, building sections. The other kind of thing that shows up, uh, if you imagine that this thing has, let's say, a little bit more information, maybe I've got some uh, corridors here, there's a person in the corridor, and in order to have a place to put the uh, HVAC, I have a lower ceiling uh, in that corridor than I do in the main space. So the building section allows me to see those kind of big 
ideas of how the spaces are being sort of uh, controlled through the ceiling planes. Uh, so that's another big thing that's, that's happening with the building sections. And then the last of the important things that's happening with the building sections is I'm going to see things like a place to say, all right, there's a detail about this parapet, and that detail is located at a specific spot. Let's say drawing four on sheet A6. Or maybe it's a wall section. I'm going to say, all right, there's the wall section, and those wall sections are on A4, and this happens to be wall section number three. So the building section, the point of a building section in a typical construction set is actually only slightly more detailed than what I've just drawn. Uh, it's really meant to be schematic. Uh, the point is as a way to give you that sort of general sense of the vertical spaces, the dimensional possibilities, and then as a reference point for other drawings. So I can figure out where I need to really get the real information but I'm not using this drawing as a way to get across detail. Detail shows up in all of the other drawings. So right off the bat, we can say the floor plans are much more schematic than this level of information, uh, and the building sections are also much more schematic than this level of information that the question is about. So then it really comes down to Division 9, Division 5. So we can start thinking about how the divisions work, uh, division two is going to be sort of site and uh, kind of existing conditions. Division three is going to be concrete. Division four is going to be masonry. Uh, division five is going to be metals. Um, and you should remember these, uh, at least the first bunch. Uh, uh, division six is uh, wood. Division seven is moisture. Um, so that's like roofs and uh, uh, flashings and things like that. Uh, division 8 is windows and doors, uh, and then Division 9 is finishes. All right, so when we look back at our question, the question is about light gauge steel and how many screws it takes, uh, and so the obvious answer is, well, you would think it would be 5, but it would be wrong. It's actually 9. It's finishes. So B is the correct answer. So this is kind of a trick question. Um, I put this on here specifically to uh, kind of call out that you have to really be careful about some of these things. Sometimes the answers seem so obvious that uh, you really have to go sort of, you know, choose the obvious one. But you have to really kind of figure out what they're really asking here. Uh, finishes is a bigger category than it might sound. You know, it has flooring and drywall and you know wallpapers and stuff like that, but it also has all the things that are associated with those elements. Uh, so in the same way that say you might have a metal flashing, well the metal flashing is going to fall under division seven, not under division five metals. So these things are slightly more complicated than they may sound. Uh, and uh, this is a particular one that is kind of famous for these sorts of questions uh, because it seems so obvious that metal studs should be in the metal category, but in fact they're usually found uh, in the uh, finishes category because it's so tightly, you can't really talk about drywall partitions without thinking of the metal studs associated with them. So I think that one is trickster enough that uh, I'm, I'm going to give my blessing to say that if somebody didn't get that one right, uh, uh, that they could uh, still get the t-shirt. What yeah. do you say, Mark? <clears throat> yeah, I have to say here, we had um, uh, almost no, but well, that's not fair. We had six out of uh, maybe like 10% or so uh, of our group got it right. Yeah. And Impressive job on those six. Almost every single other person. Yeah. Think, it's, okay. It really, this is absolutely a kind of a trick question. Unfortunately, it's a kind of trick question that might show up on the exam. Um, I, I've seen this on other uh, practice exams, uh, both from NCARB and from other places, some, something, a similar version to this. So, I, like, I know it's out there, um, and there's some other examples, like I said, the flashing and some of these other ones. So you just have to be a little careful about how you think about these things. Don't uh, jump straight to the conclusion. Okay. Uh, do you want to head on to the next one? All right. Number three.
A performance specification relies on, let's see, and then answer A would be commissioning to confirm performance one year after substantial completion. Answer B would be a description of how a material needs to perform without specifying the maker of the material. Number C would be a series of at least three choices of each material topic. And then D, the addition of or equal in order to provide opportunities for the contractor to find cheaper but equivalent materials. So what this is really talking about is there are two basic kinds of uh, specification books. And the two basic kinds are proprietary and performance. There's a couple different names because there's lots of different versions of each one. Um, but the sort of two ideas here are uh, proprietary is when I say, all right, here's the thing I want you to put in. So let's say it's a uh, example I usually use is carpet. Let's say it's a, a, a particular kind of carpet. And so I'm going to say it's a Mannington or, or it's a, um, uh, you know, it's a, another carpet maker. And I'm going to give you a specific example of a particular carpet uh, and the model number and all the sort of uh, accompanying information. And then the contractor, when they bid the project, uh, is going to include that particular carpet choice in their estimate, and then when they build out the project, when they've been chosen as the GC, uh, would actually install that particular carpet that you would, it's a proprietary, you've set a particular named project, uh, named uh, material. Sometimes proprietary, you might have three different named materials. That's a sort of a classic thing, sort of give a little bit of variety so that for some reason, uh, one of them is much more expensive than you thought, then that gives you a way of kind of uh, giving a, a couple of choices. Um, sometimes uh, uh, giving three just sort of gives, uh, you know, one contractor may have a relationship with one distributor and another contractor may have a relationship with a different distributor. It's not really a reasonable thing to sort of choose a contractor based on the fact that, you know, their carpet supplier doesn't carry the, the specific one that you chose. So there's a bunch of reasons that you might have more than one name, but essentially a proprietary system is where you're naming the particular uh, uh, materials. So it could be uh, hardware for doors, hinges and, and handles and that kind of thing. It could be carpeting, could be uh, uh, different drywall types. It could be, there's all kinds, of, you know, anything that's being named, it, it's a, it would be a named thing where the specific maker and model would be given. That's proprietary. A performance spec, is where you're saying, okay, I'm not going to uh, give you the name of the uh, material. What I'm going to give you is what I need to have happen from this material. So for the carpet, you might say it has to be a carpet that has a, um, uh, a flame spread of such and such and a uh, acoustic uh, uh, NC rating of such and such, and a uh, uh, you know a durability rating from whatever the durability folks uh, on carpets would be uh, of of whatever that important thing you would need, uh, and so you'd be giving what performance you need to get from that carpet or from that door handle or from that uh, drywall system. Uh, and then the contractor's job is to then find a, an appropriate material that meets the performance. So this is kind of a funny thing. It's very, it's sort of two very different ways of approaching uh, a, a different, you know, these different ideas of how you approach uh, choosing materials. One is that the architect is in full control and is naming the product products, and the other one is saying this is this is the kind of thing we need. This is the performance we need find us something that you think will be good. And the whole point of a performance uh, specification is that if the, the idea behind it is if the contractor has the freedom to look around and find something that meets all the needs, they have a strong desire because they're bidding against other contractors. They have a strong desire to have their number be lower. And so they're looking for a way to bring the numbers down, but then they still have to meet the performance. And so the idea here is it's a way to get the contractors to find better, um, cheaper uh, materials that still meet 
the performance that you need them to meet. So when you see a question about performance specifications, it's almost always about uh, helping the owners get a cheaper building because you're providing enough information that the contractors are able to get the right and the right kind of product that's going to meet the performance needs, but that they have the choice to find cheaper versions than maybe the architect even knows about. One of the things you'll notice is that when you get a, a you know something in the you get one of those big binders from a manufacturer, they almost never have the price list in them. And why is that? Because they don't really want the architects to know about the pricing. I mean, you can always find it. You can always get that pricing. But uh, there's a strong desire to have the architects just sort of fall in love with the, the materials and then specify them uh, so that things get in there uh, into the, into the uh, projects. But that isn't always the cheapest uh, or the most sort of uh, efficient way to, to move forward. Uh, and so this is a, the performance idea is a way to kind of get around that issue. Contractors should know more about pricing than the architects do. Uh, it's sort of the natural breakup of the expertise. Uh, so the idea is put all that into their category. So all of that said, when you see performance, what performance specifications are about is going to be about B, a description of how a material needs to perform without specifying the actual maker of the material. Specifications might be all proprietary, they might be all performance. I think like in Germany and places like that, they're almost always performance. Um, uh, often though, there'll be some mix of those things that you'll have proprietary for a whole lot of stuff and performance for particular things that uh, you just think it's gonna be the most logical way to, to move forward that the contractor will be able to have more flexibility and find better products for you. Okay. Uh, looks like <clears throat> looks like pretty much everybody got this one right. So pretty straightforward. Cool. Okay, number four. Your client is looking for advice on a project delivery. Their main concern is speed, the schedule. Which delivery method would you likely suggest? So okay, the obvious uh, set of choices of project delivery would be the sort of standard, which would be design, bid, build. Uh, which is where you as the architect get hired to design something. Uh, eventually you get to the end of your process. Uh, it's bid out to a number of different contractors. Uh, eventually a contractor is chosen and then they build it. So uh, there's a bunch of advantages to that, but speed is definitely not one of them. Uh, another sort of logical one would be design build. Uh, another possibility would be construction manager or CM, I'm just going to say construction manager, CM. Uh, construction manager is when the uh, owner, instead of hiring a GC, actually hires a construction manager uh, on staff. Now I'm saying on staff, there's a couple different ways it could be. It wouldn't necessarily be an employee uh, in the technical sense, but I think it's, that's the easiest way to think about what a construction manager is. It's like an employee. Uh, and so a construction manager is somebody who's employed by the owner and the idea for a construction manager is, is a couple things. One is um, they can, um, uh, clients don't like uh, the fact that the GCs get to have all that overhead and profit uh, go into them and it would be nice if they could take that profit back. Well, by hiring a construction manager, you're, you're taking the profit back because you are now effectively acting as your own GC. Um, but the big reason, especially on the exam, the big reason that construction manager is useful is that it brings a lot of cost information because you have somebody who's there to help do all the estimates early on. So the construction manager and the architects at schematic design, design development, uh, are talking about uh, cost and pricing uh, all the way through. So construction manager, that's the big advantage. You get that early cost information. Um, so bunch of advantages to design build, bunch of advantages to construction manager. None of them are really about being super fast. The main one that's going to be about fast is going to be, even has fast in the, in the name, fast track. Uh, and so that's going to be the answer. Uh, fast track is a completely ridiculous way to build, but it's very quick. Um, fast track is where you start building 
uh, or excuse me, you start designing the uh, excavation and concrete uh, for the foundations. You get that package up, you hand it over to the contractor, they start building it. While they're building that, you start designing the uh, structural uh, frame and maybe the shell. Uh, you do that set of drawings, you hand that over to the contractor, they start building it as soon as they get it, as soon as the foundation is done, and then you're now back on to designing the, um, you know, the interiors and the other things. So you kind of go through a whole series of these different packages, uh, and that allows the, uh, the project to move forward much more quickly than obviously compared to something like design bid build or even design build. Design builds can be faster than design bid build, but uh, uh, but not as fast as fast track. And uh, that obvious disadvantage to designing while the building is going on is that clearly you're going to make mistakes and uh, things you're you're not going to know uh, information you need to know like. You're going to put the foundation in, but then somebody, maybe you decide down the road that you really need to have uh, plumbing in a different part of the building as well. And so now somebody's got to go back through, instead of doing it before they put the foundation in, uh, they, they have to put it in after. And it costs a lot of extra money. So uh, fast track is always uh, more expensive, but the question there is often it's more expensive because you have to make adaptations and change things but that more expense may be less money than the total cost uh, if you start looking at a very expensive site like the loan costs uh, for uh, you know building in the middle of Manhattan or something like that. It may make sense to spend $500,000 extra uh, doing it fast track in order to get the building up and running faster uh, because you might save more than the $500,000 uh, in, in that process. Um, so, okay, design, bid, build, design, build, construction managers, a few other ones as well. Those are sort of the main ones. In this case, they're clearly talking about fast track. Fast track is not particularly common. Um, this, you know, it shows up every once in a while, but it's kind of common on the exam because it's such a particular thing and it's an easy one to ask questions about. All right, number five. The client is having some second thoughts about the current designs and calls and asks to see all the original pencil sketches from when the architects did their initial internal office meetings. The architects don't want to give them over since they don't want to confuse the situation. They, they don't want to have multiple versions of things uh, floating around. Uh, so they don't want to give them over, but the client is looking for it. Who should win the argument? All right, so we have a couple different answers here. Uh, a, the architects, they are not required to present work that they do that they no longer support. Uh, B, it would be decided by arbitration. Uh, C, the client, because they get everything. D, it would be decided by the IDM. Uh, so there's an important concept here that this is actually what's really being alluded to is uh, part of the contract, the B101, the, the owner-architect uh, contract, is the idea of the instruments of service. So it's a very particular term. It's one worth remembering. Uh, instruments of service. And what that's referring to is when you're an architect and you're doing a project, you have to do a whole lot of different things, a whole lot of different types of work in order to be able to do the design. So you might be researching countertop material, or you might be researching um, uh, glass wall systems, curtain walls, something like that. It might be that you do a lot of different sketches. You might be doing um, maybe different uh, overlays of different ways that you could have uh, uh, you know, a set of offices, maybe the you try one sort of planning bubble diagram where uh, the marketing people are next to the admin people and then you try another one where facilities people are next to the admin people. Like you might have a lot of different sort of research things that you do before you actually get to sort of final designs and things that you're going to hand over and at you know, sort of the big milestones. Um, that's all the instruments of service. It would include even memos and uh, all the all the other things that it takes to make a, a project happen. Intriguingly, uh, 
technically the client actually has, unless it's written, unless you change the documents in some way in a typical uh, uh, AIA contract, the client actually has uh, rights to all of your instruments of service. Now, this is not like, you know, the vast majority of the time, no client really cares about any of that. It just doesn't, like, why would they want to look at your memos, your inner office memos or anything? Uh, it's just not something that's going to come up. But from the technical standpoint of this, the client is paying for time and that what they're paying for, they actually have rights to see and to be able to use. So that means both the CD sets, it means the research, it means all the memos, it means any of the sketches. Um, there's a few ways you could look at this. It would depend a little bit on how things were uh, specifically worded and it would depend a little bit on uh, how you did your timesheets and some other things like that. But the gist of it is, yes, they have the right to see this information. Uh, so C would be the correct answer. Like I said, it's kind of unlikely that they would really want to see this. Mostly it's just going to confuse everybody. Uh, that's not really the point of the question. The point of the question is, do you really grasp the idea of the instruments of service, which is that uh, there's a, it takes a lot of work to do a project, uh, and what the client is paying you for is to do all of that work. Uh, and then they also get all the drawings and everything at the end, but uh, they're paying you for all of that work. So for example, maybe you're an office that does a lot of different kinds of research. If you really wanted to keep that research in-house and not be uh, open to other people, then you wouldn't do it under the billing of a particular project. You would do it under the sort of overhead uh, work that you do in the office. Um, because if it's billed directly to a client, then they get access to that information. So hopefully that's sort of clear. Uh, a couple of the other words in here. Uh, arbitration is obviously a way of uh, doing uh, when there's disputes. Uh, and then the DIDM is initial decision maker. That's also a dispute resolution system. Uh, and uh, while this is talking about a dispute, neither arbitration or IDM would uh, re really come into play. Uh, the intriguing thing about the IDM, the initial decision maker, is uh, that's you. Uh, the architect is the IDM. And the idea on that one is if there's a dispute between the owner, uh, client owner, and a contractor, as they are having their dispute, the first thing they're supposed to do, the initial thing they're supposed to do, is they go to the initial decision maker and they present their case, and then the architect would uh, uh, make a uh, sort of ruling on it, it's not ruling would be kind of the wrong terminology, but uh, would would make a decision uh, and presumably they would live with that decision if the dispute went on, then it would go to either uh, arbitration or mediation or litigation or something. Um, but the idea is to have a sort of cheaper, faster way to deal with things before they get out of hand and that would be the architect being the IDM. It doesn't have to be the architect. Sometimes there's a third-party IDM that gets delineated early on in the contract process. So IDMs are kind of interesting, but not really appropriate to this, uh, to this actual question. Okay, it looks like um, that was kind of a tricky one. It was a pretty good blend of uh, answers A, D being the two most popular answers, and then C was sort of, again, maybe like 10 or 15% of the folks thought that was the one. Yeah, um, I mean, certainly A is the one we all want, right? Um, we want to have control over what we give give to folks. And like I said, the vast majority of time, if you actually explain to a client, like, no, I don't want to give that to you because it'll give you the wrong impression, like, you know, no client really wants to go against you on that stuff. So it it's, uh, it's not a particularly good example from the standpoint of real life, uh, but the exam isn't about real life, the exam is about uh, kind of understanding the points of the uh, contracts. Okay. How about number six? Number six. All right. After the house is finished, the developer client uses the drawings to build another three houses. They said they paid for the design, therefore they should be able to reuse it. Are they right? 
Uh, answer A is yes, because they paid for the design. Answer B is no, because they have no rights to the design. Answer C is there is no copyright on architectural design. And answer D is yes, but only if they have specifically stated so in the original contract. So this is there's a basic issue uh, on the typical contract that um, that shows up a lot, and people misunderstand this one a lot. Architects generally get it pretty well, but clients misunderstand this a lot. Uh, the basic issue is the architect always has the copyright unless it's specifically delineated in the contract that they don't have the copyright. Um, so the people who would do that, uh, for some reason, often like federal and people federal projects always require the copyright. I don't know what that's about. But the people who where it really makes sense would be like franchisees. Like if you have uh, if you're doing something for McDonald's or for uh, In and Out Burger or something like that, uh, like they want to own all the design because it's a huge part of their business, their their marketing and all of that. And they can't let other people kind of have that. So there there are places where it totally makes sense that the owners would take over the copyright, uh, and they would have to do that in the contract. They would actually scratch out part of the contract and write in that you know the owner owner of the copyright will be the the client. Um, but uh, the typical contract, the architect always retains copyright. But, and this is a big but, the big but is the client has full rights to use the design for that project in that location. So if client has paid you for a design, even if there's a dispute along the way, even if you end up, uh, you know, the project never goes to completion, but you had a bunch of drawings that did get done, uh, and they paid you for those drawings, they have the right to use that design for that project in that location. They can have another architect come and take it over and, and continue on the design, um, because that they have the rights to that. You have the copyright, but they have the rights to use it for that project in that location. Uh, what this project is saying is, okay, so they've done a house and now they're doing three more. Well, the only way uh, that that would be reasonable, so answer A, yes, because they paid for the design, that's not a reasonable answer because uh, that's not enough information. Just because they paid for one design doesn't mean they paid for uh, doing these other three houses in different locations. By, you know, the, just by saying three more houses, those are clearly in three other locations. Uh, so that clearly doesn't doesn't work. So it's definitely not A. Uh, and then B, no, because uh, the owners have no rights on to the design. Well, that's not right. We just said they have uh, full rights to use the design. They don't have copyright, but they have full rights to use the design in that location for that project. So it's not B. Uh, and then C, there is no copyright in architectural design. We just said the architects retain the copyright. So the answer is D. Yes, they can do it, but only if they have a in this original contract has been written in that they are going to reuse these designs. And typically what you would do on that situation is you would have a contract price uh, for your fee and then a reuse fee. So maybe you might charge, uh, let's say $10,000 for the original one and then $1,000 each for each additional time they use it, uh, something like that. Like you would build that into the original contract. Uh, if they didn't do that on the original contract, then uh, they're in the wrong and you could actually potentially sue them. All right. All right. Number seven. The blank are part of the contract documents. Uh, hopefully this is a pretty easy one. Um, uh, the, let's just jump straight to the answer. The answer is going to be B, the addenda. The addenda are part of the contract documents. So uh, why not the shop drawings? So who produces the shop drawings? Shop drawings are produced by uh, all sorts of other people. Um, you may look at them, and they're part of the overall project, 
um, but they are not part of your contract um, and they are not part of the sort of contract documents that you have prepared for the uh, contractor. Uh, contract documents is kind of an interesting term. When you think about what that means, uh, contract documents are essentially saying when you produce a set of, of drawings, of both the drawing set and the project manual, what you're making is somebody else's contract. You're making the materials that will define the contract between the owner and the general contractor. So that's why we call them contract documents is that uh, that's what you're aiming towards is to make their contract. And so all the stuff that you're doing in order to make their contract is doing all that design, you're putting all the information together, you're putting the specifications together, and then the contractor is responding with shop drawings. So the contractor is saying, okay, we read your contract documents, this is our understanding of how the steel is going to get laid out, or this is our understanding of how the millwork is going to uh, get put together. Uh, and that's their process. You have a role to play in that process, which is to sort of review and to uh, speak up if you see any problems. Um, but essentially, that's their process. So that's not part of your making of the contract documents. Uh, it's their process. You just have a response to it. RFP is clearly before there's even a contract. An RFP is a request for a proposal. So that's at the very, very, very beginning of a project. And what you're doing is you're saying, what the owner is doing is saying, okay, we have a project. We want to get people interested uh, in being the designers for it. Uh, so we're going to put out an RFP and everybody responds and you say, yes, I want to do this project and here's how I would respond to it. So there is no contract yet. You don't even have a contract yet, so the RFP is clearly not part of the contract documents. D, uh, construction schedule, is kind of an interesting one because D is an integral part of the contracts. It's just not an integral, integral part of your contract. Um, that the construction schedule is all about the general contractor. That's their job. You don't really have anything to to do with the construction schedule other than to help the client owner understand the, the implications of different schedule choices. So you're there to advise the client in that case, but you, you're not producing a construction schedule. Uh, so addenda. So addenda is the answer. Uh, when does the addenda happen? You put together your set of drawings. You're getting ready to bid. Uh, and as you bid them out, uh, inevitably there's some confusion and, and issues on the addenda. I mean, excuse me, on the on the con on the drawings and on the specification. And contractor calls you up and says, "Hey, I don't understand this thing. Why it says two different things in two different locations?" Uh, you never answer them. You only just take their question. And then as you get a few of those questions, you make a list of the questions and then you answer the questions in written form and you send it out to all of the bidders because you really want to make sure that you get uh, apples to apples bids. That, that document is called the addenda and so that's the system that you're altering the original uh, contract documents that you put together. You're saying here's some additional information with more detail and maybe even scratching out some of the detail and putting in new detail because you've figured out more. So once you produce an addenda, it goes in and it becomes part of the contract documents. Okay, so it looks like everybody got that one totally right. Cool. Basically. Yeah, that, that one should be a pretty straightforward one. There is an uh, interesting question from Nicole. She says, going back to question number six, if we can go back for just one sec. Mm -hmm. She said, would the client have the rights to completely rebuild the same project on the same site after a um, natural disaster? And what role would the architect be required to play? Would there be an additional fee? Wow, that's a really interesting question. Um, I I see. After a natural disaster, the house is leveled by a tornado, right, uh, and um, they still have the set of drawings. Yeah, I think they could actually just build it. Um, I think they have the right to just to just build it because it would be that project in that location. Um, 
and I don't think they would owe you any money. Now, in you know actuality, what typically happens in a situation like that is people are like, oh, I'm going to rebuild the house, but you know, sure it'd be nice to have a pool or whatever. You know that the things would actually change, or our situation is just different now. You know, the kids were young then. Now we have the kids are all in high school and they're going to go off to college soon. Maybe it becomes an office instead of another bedroom or something. So things tend to change. At which point it's actually a different uh, project, and so that's where it would get a little confusing. Um, but uh, I think the gist of it is, you know, I'm not a lawyer on this stuff, but my understanding is that it would still be the same project in the same place. Then yes, they they would have the right just to do it. Interesting question. Yeah, interesting comment from actually Jason here. He says, if it's a if it's a flood, national flood insurance will only pay to build the structure back the way it was originally. Yeah, so actually, just, flood insurance is really good. Uh, that's a good point. The flood insurance stuff is fascinating. Um, and it's only becoming weirder and more complicated because uh, there's so many, you know, with the rising uh, water levels from uh, um, climate change, uh, all of the insurance companies are doing their damnedest to figure out how to get out of flood insurance. Uh, and so the, the, the ways those things are written are becoming more and more arcane. Uh, I was just listening to uh, a seminar talking about an example of that. And somebody who had thought they had complete flood insurance was telling the story about how they ended up with uh, about, uh, I think it was maybe 50 cents on the dollar of the replacement cost uh, because of the fine print on it. So the flood insurance is a very particular part of the world uh, of, of construction law. Uh, but yeah, it's a really good example. Okay. All right. So... Up to number eight. Okay, number eight. Uh, the GC's husband leaves him for an interior designer. The enraged GC bricks up the door to the interior, interior designer's love nest, trapping them inside. The police are called in, arrest the GC for kidnapping. The GC clearly is suddenly off the project. Which of the following is important? So we've taken a little melodramatic twist here. Uh, and I've very particularly made it sort of ridiculous in order to kind of make the point uh, that we were talking about earlier, and that is that uh, you know often uh, the questions will have a whole lot of sort of red herrings in them. They'll have a whole lot of kind of uh, scenarios that are taking you in the wrong direction. The only thing that's important here, uh, the only part of this question uh, that you need to focus on is that the GC is off the project. Uh, once you realize that that's really what's happening, so it's the middle of the project and the GC is suddenly gone. Doesn't matter why, doesn't matter whatever, uh, the GC is suddenly gone. What's going to happen next? Uh, so let's look at our answers. A is professional liability insurance is going to be important. B, uh, GL insurance is going to be important. C, the G702 is going to be important. And D, the performance bond is going to be important. Uh, professional liability insurance is your insurance. Uh, it's the architect's insurance. Uh, it's often called errors and omissions. Um, the uh, PL uh, is going to be very important whenever there's anything that you have done that's negligent uh, or accidental uh, and you've made a mistake. Maybe it's a, a big mistake. Maybe it's a little mistake. Uh, but something happened that shouldn't have happened and somebody's got to pay for fixing it up, um, well, that's, that's your professional liability insurance, your errors and omissions. Um, uh, in this case, the GC leaving the project suddenly eh, doesn't really have anything to do with that. Uh, so it's definitely not A. Uh, B is uh, GL insurance, which is general liability insurance. Well, general liability insurance is something that essentially every business has. So the architecture firm you work with uh, has a GL insurance. Uh, so does the uh, restaurant uh, down the block. Uh, so does the cleaners. Uh, everybody has general liability insurance. And if somebody walks into your office, a client walks into your office and trips on the rug and falls down and breaks their leg uh, and they sue you, it's your GL insurance that's your general liability insurance that's going to pay them off. It's not your professional liability because that's only about the specifics of being an architect doing a design. Uh, so neither of those are really applicable 
Um, so it's not A, it's not B. Well, how about C? Uh, G702. Uh, G702 happens to be the uh, uh, AIA form for uh, payout requests. Uh, so that's something that's very important. Uh, it's something that you will deal with often, um, usually on a monthly basis. The contractor will do a pencil payout request uh, where you'll then review that information, either say, yes, this looks good or it doesn't. Uh, presumably it looks good. Uh, they then formalize that information, it becomes something, you sign it, uh, they sign it, it then goes to the uh, owner, to the title company or somebody who's then going to pay out that month's, um, uh, uh, the amount of money that the general contractor needs at that point. Uh, and so it's a very important thing and it, clearly the G702s would get all screwed up if the contractor was suddenly off the project and you had, had to get a new contractor. but not really the most important thing to be thinking about at that point. So the answer clearly is performance bond. And performance bond is this idea that it's a, essentially a kind of insurance uh, and it's an insurance for the owner, for the client. Uh, what they're doing when they get a performance bond is they're saying, okay, uh, I have the low bid, I've chosen the bidder, uh, we have a contractor, we're moving forward and uh, my, uh, my only worry is, you know, what happens if this guy can't fulfill the promise that they've made by being selected as, a, as a, the, the winning bidder? What happens if something takes them away from the project? Uh, and it's obviously, let's say a contractor gets 50% of the way through a, a project, and then for whatever reason, maybe they get arrested for kidnapping, or maybe it's something completely more reasonable. Um, uh, but suddenly they're gone from the project. And so they're 50% of the way through, the owner has to find a new contractor to finish off the rest. Is that new contractor going to cost uh, to do the last 50%, just 50% of the overall cost that was already started? Well, no, obviously it's gonna be, it's gonna be much more expensive. The new contractor's gonna have to mobilize. They're not gonna know exactly where the work stopped and started. They're gonna have to kind of go back and redo pieces that didn't get finished enough. So uh, typically that way is something, an example like that, it might be more like 75% of the cost, which means there's an extra 25% of cost uh, that's going to happen. That's a big uh, worry. So what does the owner do? They get a performance bond. It's an insurance for stopping that to happen. What happens is if the if the contractor leaves the project, then um, the this particular insurance company would come in and pay for the new contractor to take over the project and would pay the difference uh, between the original contract and this uh, what it takes to get the second contractor going. So clearly the insurance companies are only going to give uh, performance bonds to contractors that they deem uh, sort of a, a reasonable uh, bet. Uh, they're not going to, you know, if you just have somebody off the street, they're not going to give you a performance bond or they're going to charge you a whole lot of money for it. Um, and the other kind of interesting thing is often the contractors will put the performance bonds into their line items, uh, into their, their uh, estimates and their bids. Uh, but only if it, they've been asked to, but they'll put them into their, uh, into their bids in, as a line item. And the reason for that is that often owners just don't want to uh, pay for it out of pocket. They want it to go into their loan. And so that's a way of making that happen. <coughs> okay. Let's see here. So, uh, yeah, pretty much everybody got this one, right? Yeah, that should be one that's pretty straightforward. Performance bond is definitely something that might show up. I have to say that this is, I think, our first mock exam question that has been tweeted. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody tweeted, uh, let's see who it was, uh, Jennifer at uh, <coughs> Archography, I guess, at Ar Archography, um, <laughs> tweeted this picture to us, which is pretty awesome. So That's great. Nice question writing, Mike. <laughs> there we go. All right. All right, number nine. Um, so this one should also be pretty straightforward. Uh, this is a very simple version of this question. You could imagine very complicated versions of this question. Question number nine, the change order always describes the changes to what three aspects of a contract. So the first thing to say there is, well, that's interesting. 
it's already telling us in the question that change orders are part of the contract, which they are. Uh, when we say a change order, what we're saying is uh, there's a change to the contract. When we talk about a contract, especially the contract between the owner and the contractor, the general contractor, there's this great term that I love which is called the essence of the contract. It's a legal term and what it's referring to is that there are lots of parts of a contract. You know, There's a whole range of different things but the, the essence of the contract, the, the, the meaning, the core of the contract is when an owner hires a GC uh, to, to do the project, they hire them to build a specific scope of work and they give a very particular fee to do that and they say how long it's going to take. That's the essence of the, of the contract. Then there's going to be a whole bunch of other things about you're going to relate to this, you're going to submit uh, you know, payment requests every month or every two months or every week. Uh, you're going to put the portageons on the alley side, not on the street front side. There's a million other things that might be in that contract. But the essence of the contract is, is a particular scope of work. Uh, that scope of work has been identified through the architect's contract documents. Uh, it's labeled and, and listed in their contract. The GC is going to put a particular fee so that's listed and they're going to say this will take six months or this will take nine months or this will take a year and a half. So that's listed. That's the essence of the contract. Well, the change order, just like any other part of the contract, it's still the essence of the contract. So when something changes, when the design needs to change in the middle of the construction, the first thing is obviously how much is this going to change from a dollar standpoint. The second thing is what's the scope difference? It might be giant, like, okay, we're no longer going to be able to build the south wing to the project because it turns out I didn't win Powerball. I was sure I was going to win it, but I didn't. Uh, so I have to get rid of the south wing. Or it might be something simple, like, uh, you know, we were going to build in the bunk beds. I went to Ikea and I found a really great bunk bed, so we're not going to do that anymore. So it might be small, it might be large, but it's going to have a scope change and a dollar change and a time change, a schedule change. So those are going to be the three aspects that will always be the essence of any of the contractual elements. Now intriguingly, it might be that, well, the time change is, well, zero days. It's not going to make any difference. doesn't matter. You still put it in. It might be uh, that the cost is zero because uh, we're switching one thing for another and they're roughly the same cost. Uh, it's even possible that the scope is zero. Uh, because you might be saying something like, all right, we had a deadline built into the, to the contract. We, we said we're absolutely going to be able to move in on September 1st, uh, and, but then the client really wants to use a certain floor tile, and there was a fire in the manufacturer. They can't get the floor tile out for an extra three weeks. Uh, so if the contract has a deadline built into it, and the contractor, even for totally something that's not their fault, uh, they need to change the contract in order to uh, not be in breach of the contract, then they would do a change order. It might not change the dollar, it might not change the scope, but in that case, it would change the time. So at least one of those things has to have a number in it, but you would always say all three. And then once you have that out, they would all be organized, they'd be numbered, they'd be in an order. You'd start with the, uh, what the original contract is. You'd then add and subtract the various uh, change orders as it goes along. You'd have the current contract amount. Uh, and then you'd say what this one is doing. Is it changing? Is it changing the times? Changing the scope? Is it changing the, uh, the dollar? All right. Let's go to 10. So 10 is a little, uh, it has a couple different ways that you could imagine uh, uh, doing it. 10 is, would just as easily be uh, a PPP um, uh, question, but it has uh, a, uh, an aspect for us, for our purposes as well. So this one's a little bit wordy, but let's sort of run through it. The principle is presenting the client with the SD drawings in hopes of getting a sign-off to be able to move on to DD. So far, the principal has spent 12 hours on the project. The project architect has spent six, 60 hours on the project. 
project manager has spent 60 hours on the project, and each of the three designers working under them has spent 100 hours on the project. The overall fee is 120,000. How's it going? So what is this really getting at? Well, all we really have here is money. So what this is talking about is, does the money match the schedule? We have a very particular point in time. We're at the sign-off of SD, so we're at the changeover of SD to DD. Uh, so we have a scheduled moment, and we have a dollar. So let's figure out what's going on. So just to sort of clarify, I have SD, which is schematic design. I have DD, which is design development. I have CD, which people will often refer to as construction drawings. But for our purposes, when we're talking about the exam, we should really think of as contract documents, CDs. Happens to be both CDs. Uh, so that's what's uh, the, that phase. And then there's bidding. And then eventually there's CA, and that's construction administration. Uh, sometimes you'll see other terms used. Uh, it should never be, the other term should never be supervision. It might be observation, um, something like that. But if you say supervision, then you better have a contractor's license and contractor's insurance. Uh, because by using the word supervision, you've just taken over all the liability. So those are the five stages of a typical contract. Uh, there might be stuff that happens before that. You might have programming work. You might have... Uh, uh, feasibility studies. You might do marketing drawings so that the client can do fundraising. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that might happen uh, before a project starts, but those would be extra to the uh, contract. They, those would be either be specifically um, uh, delineated in the contract and brought out with an with a extra amount of money, uh, or they might uh, uh, be a separate contract altogether. So there's stuff that happens before that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that actually happens before that, but the contract starts at the SD, essentially. Uh, then after CA, there's a bunch of work that might be commissioning or warranties or post-occupancy studies. It's a whole bunch of other things that might happen uh, as you get past the, uh, the finish of the construction. But again, uh, those would have to be specially delineated in the contract uh, for you to get paid for them. So uh, if you're going to be doing a post-occupancy study, you would actually either contract for it separately, so it's its own contract, or you would have an additional service. So that's the key term, the additional service on the contract. So this is how we sort of generally uh, kind of break these things out, and it shows up in the contracts like this. And generally, there's a few different numbers that people use, but generally, under SD, we think about that as about 15%. DD is about 20% of the contract. CDs are about 45% of the contract. Bidding is usually listed as 5% of the contract. And then I think it's 15% uh, for CA. Now, is it always these exact numbers? No, sometimes it's a little bit different. Uh, are these numbers going to remain the same forever? No. With the advent of uh, BIM and uh, all the building information technologies, these things are starting to get mucked around because it doesn't make the same sense as it used to. But right now, it's still the contracts. This is still how it's thought of. Uh, and so uh, that's the number set that I have. All right. So we went through and we... Uh, uh, looked at kind of where we're at and kind of how the percentages work. Now let's take a quick look at uh, what so far everything has cost. Um, so we've got the uh, principal 12 hours at uh, 200 smackers an hour, uh, and so that's going to be totaling about 2,400. Um, we've got uh, the project architect um, uh, at 60 hours times, uh, what was it, 140. Uh, that's going to be equal to, what, I think it's 8,400. Somebody feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. I'm doing this kind of from memory. Uh, then we've got the project manager at uh, 120. Uh, and so, okay, that's going to be, let's see, 60 times 120. That's going to be, what, uh, 7,200. Uh, and then we have uh, all the rest of us doing the actual work. All the people 
really making it happen. That's going to be three people at 100, so that's 300 uh, times uh, 80 bucks an hour each for them. And so clearly that's about uh, 24 24,000. Uh, so, okay, we total that up and we get, I think it's 42,000. So we've spent 42,000 in time so far using these billing rates. So how are we doing? Well, if we're only at this point, we're presenting for the SD, we should only have spent 15% of our budget. Our total uh, fee was 120,000. 15% of 120,000 is 18,000. So we are way behind. C is the answer. Uh, sometimes you'll see people will do, will flip these and do 20% for SD and 15% for DD. Uh, even then, that would only be uh, 24,000. We'd still be way behind. Uh, so the point of this one is you need to know uh, these, the breakout of the SD to the CA and the sort of general percentages. Uh, and you also need to understand the sort of concept of the billable hours and how billable hours, uh, you know, these things are not, uh, you, you don't just make up a number. You actually think about how many hours it should take to do each of these steps. And then you need to meet those hours. If you don't, uh, like what's going to happen on this project is they are now way behind, so they've used up all of this uh, amount of the fee uh, before they've even uh, gotten to this point, to the SD point. And that means they now have to fit in design development and CDs in just that tiny amount of, of space. Uh, it's going to be very uh, difficult, and they're probably going to lose money on this project. What you're trying to make sure is that you understand not only how to put a set together, but that you understand the sort of contractual relationships of how these things kind of meet. So one quick example of that, let's say at this meeting, the principal is presenting the SD drawings. Let's say the clients just come back and say, you know, it's just not moving me. I'm just not into it. It's not working. There's a way out from the, from the contract for the client. They can then say, this isn't, this isn't working. I'm going to let you go. Uh, well, when they do that, you're going to give them a bill of 42000 because that's how much time you've spent. And they're going to give you a check for 18000 because they say, hey, this is SD. We're only paying you up to the 15% point. So there's a direct relationship between kind of managing the project and how the contracts and how the financial relationships work. So that's why I'm sort of putting this one in here. So that's a lot of numbers. Hopefully that was all pretty clear. Uh, but there you go. See, we're way behind. Actually, Ben thinks that uh, this project is way overstaffed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm with you, Ben. Uh, you know. um, and he actually also makes an interesting question. Um, he just wants to clarify overhead and profit should be included in the billing rates too, right? Yeah. Um, Those are kind of like baked in to the billing rates. Yeah, the, so the billing rates, like, you know, Nobody's being paid two hundred dollars an hour. Um, you know what they're being paid is some amount of money, and then there's also the amount of money we need to cover insurance, and the amount of money that we need to cover the rent, and the amount of money we need to cover uh, the fact that the principal always goes on vacation and tries to find a way to bill it to the office, and then uh, the amount of money, like all of that stuff, has to get into those billable uh, rates, and the overhead and profit would also be in there would be built into those billable hours. Now, occasionally, this is a, a particular kind of, there are other ways of doing this. Um, you know, sometimes you'll find that uh, the way that the client really wants to work is they want to do it where uh, they see all of your hours, they see the actual rates of payment, they see the, the uh, sort of amortization of the amounts of money for the overhead, and then they'll give you a profit at the end. Like that's a totally reasonable way to do things, but it's not the typical way of doing things. And that, that would have to be like on the exam, they would have to spell that out that that's what they're talking about. If they if they're just talking about a typical relationship, then the expectation would it would all be built into the billable hours. Okay. Beautiful. Um, so I think 
we've uh, we've gone over here and we've uh, answered quite a few questions along the way. So I'm going to go ahead and um, and close it up. Okay. Um, can you open up random.org on the web? Can you go down to the bottom here and grab Chrome and go to random.org so we can pick our winner? Chrome. Chrome. Sorry. Yeah. Just real quick. Um, all right. Beautiful. Okay. So um, before we do that, I just want to thank um, thank everybody for uh, for tuning in. Mike, thanks for you know. To, <laughs> thanks to you for putting together these uh, awesome questions. Um, and of course, everyone who's to submitted their question today. Uh, and just a reminder, if you'd like to attend our next ARE Live broadcast, where we'll discuss the site planning uh, and design exam, you can visit blackspectacles.com slash podcast to register. And just like today's episode, you can ask questions and share your answers with Mike for feedback uh, during the broadcast. Uh, and to learn more about our AIA uh, ARE prep curriculum, go to blackspectacles.com, where you can try out any of the free course videos. Um, and then, Mike, could you switch back to uh, PDF for me? You can just click here. Yeah, there you go. So, um, so for those of you who are ready to start preparing for the ARE, uh, and if you're already an AIA member, is a part of our partnership with the AIA, you can visit that URL, that second URL there, uh, bksp.es slash cds slash or dash AIA ARE prep uh, to get a 15% discount for the entire duration of your AIA. AIA ARE prep membership. Um, we were tracking all of our uh, folks who submitted their questions via PDF before uh, noon central time today uh, and it looked like there were uh, two people who got everything right and that was Stephen and Ken. Uh, Stephen and Ken I messaged both of you um, the link to get your free t-shirt. Nice job. Chat box. So yeah. That's impressive. There's a couple tricky ones there. Yeah, yeah. so that was a uh, so good job. Um, and then, so as you guys know, we want to give away a, a free um, one-month membership for Black Spectacles AIA ARE prep tutorials and our design software tutorials where you can learn things like Revit, V-Ray, and, uh, and Grasshopper. Um, Mike, can you go to that random generator.org? So I have everybody here. Um, hit generate. Yeah, yeah, so if you hit a generate, I can tell you who the winner is. 34. Number 34. Number 34 is OB. So OBI will be sending you an email um, with some information about your free uh, Black Spectacles membership. Uh, so thanks everybody for, um, for participating in that. Thank you uh, for submitting all your answers. Uh, make sure you submit your answers for our next mock exam, which again will be on the site planning and design exam, so you can be entered into our uh, monthly drawing. Uh, finally, please leave a comment below the video to let us know what you think and share any suggestions you may have. I promise we'll read every word that you write and use them to tune our next episodes. So thanks for watching.